Yay! <laughs> Brad, um, it's an absolute honor to have you on the show. So first of all, thank you for joining and taking your time. Thank you so, so much. I'm stoked to be here. Great to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. And also before we start, I mean, I it's a third time, but also again, happy, happy, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And now on German, vielen Dank. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I want to practice my German, you know. No, kidding. And you know, um, it's so beautiful. Just, I think, the other day, I read uh, something about like why Romans, the ancient Romans, kind of like why they celebrated the birthdays. And the meaning was beautiful. So for them, celebrating the birthday was kind of like to honor one sole unique gift and their existence in the universe. And oh. yeah, it's very beautiful. It's like they understood that we all kind of like contribute something very unique to this world. And they honored it on that day. <laughs> Okay, that puts a nice meaning into it because I was, um, I didn't have the interest to really put time to celebrating my birthday or mm -hmm. to building a group of people and friends. And I would say I have few close friends and then I have a bunch of people I know. Yeah. A bunch. And I feel very well connected to all of them. Uh, but I just didn't have the capacity to do so. And then, um, uh, the girl that I'm seeing right now had mm -hmm. very, very um, nice. She knew that I, I think she knew me well enough. So she knew that I wasn't going to plan anything for my birthday. And so she <laughs> threw a surprise party for me last night. And that that made me feel very special. And it, it kind mm -hmm. of made me think about how the importance of celebrating a birthday, not for the reasons of how uh, to be seen, but more mm -hmm. like just the fact that you can exist and spend time with these people. So this is Absolutely. a really nice quote that I, didn't think of before. Yeah. Thanks. I find also very, because I have a very similar attitude to you. Like for me, I never, especially the last 10 years almost, so that for me, my birthday was, you know, I didn't want to really celebrate it. Yeah. But this year I changed my mind and I was like, hey, I'm going to organize a small Wim Hof retreat for my close friends. So I'm going to give it back. Yeah. And go yeah, organize. That's, yeah. That, I thought about something like this. It, it is about the give back and the, yeah. Exactly. I have some nice cards actually I got written and I was really impressed with the words. I Aww. didn't expect this to be, yeah, right? You, I did not ex expect people to see me this well mm -hmm. because, I, I mean, I think people see me for who I am, but then you see it in written format and you're like, oh, that was much more emotional and much more personal than I ever could have imagined. Wow. So unexpected. Yeah. And, but okay, Wim Hof Retreat. I hope you have a great time. <laughs> you're going to have to explain more to me about this later. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Actually, like coming back to honoring one's, um, one's sole unique gift and existence, you're a yoga teacher and coach, and you have helped thousands of people to transform their lives through movement and mindfulness. And actually, I'm quoting now, I'm going to quote you something that you wrote, because you wrote something on your bio. I found it beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. So you wrote, um, I associated movement growing up with feeling safe in my body finding more connection to myself and being joyful by, by sifting and sorting the countless thoughts in my head. So movement became a way of pressing reset. I found this beautiful. And so my first question is, Lee. <laughs> I just got chills. I didn't, I wrote this like seven years ago or something. <laughs> Don't think about it again. Okay. What's your question? Beautiful. So when did you, consciously discover or became aware of your unique gift or your calling, so to say, to become a yoga teacher and coach? Thanks for the question. Uh, that's, that's, wow. um, that's emotional. So I would say that um, I didn't know I had it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm more, I started with, um, because I played sports as a kid, I always felt like I learned the best through teaching others. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I think there was like a Chinese proverb or something about like teaching a man to fish and you teach them, right? To yep. mm -hmm. have it for a lifetime. And I felt like I learned best by teaching others. So I always was like the, the talkative, slightly annoying kid that had good intentions that always wanted <laughs> to go, hey, let me help you. This is how you catch a ball in baseball. Move your left foot, then right foot, then pick up the ball, then throw. I remember doing this to kids. I, I don't know. There's a weird memory in my head of doing this on the baseball field, mm -hmm. maybe at like, 
I don't know, eight years old, nine years old. And then I needed to get my first job. Mm -hmm. My mom was pushing me. So I applied to a tennis. Um, how do I, how do you explain it? What the heck are they called? Tennis facilities? <laughs> <laughs> my brain doesn't compute with English anymore because I'm speaking German so much. Um, yeah. It was a, a tennis court or a tennis. Um, what the heck, what's the name? I can't believe I'm forgetting it. You know what I'm talking about, though, right? Like, what, they call it a sport holla. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my English. <laughs> Wait, sport okay. holla, like a, a, well, is it, it, is it kind of like a... Tennis club. Hold a tennis club, yes. Hold tennis club. Club. There wow. we go. Okay, all right. I try not to curse on here either. But no, I like no, to curse. Fred, but... feel free. Feel free <laughs> okay, to curse. Right. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, so um, I applied to my first tennis club because I was playing baseball and tennis about the same time. Mm -hmm. Baseball was my first sport and tennis. And... Uh, to make it a long story short, I got the job to teaching tennis, and I was wow. 15 years old. I was mm -hmm. quite talented with tennis, but at the same time, talent only goes so far. You need, I don't know, eight hours a day of keep playing. Yeah. And I played maybe one to two max. Um, so it doesn't matter. You don't have the, enough playing time. But I was good at teaching. I ended up teaching um, my high school coach. Wow. I was wow. teaching him how to improve his serve. And um, it was quite interesting. Yeah, it was quite an interesting talent that I just, I didn't know I had it. it just, I just came. And yeah. then I found yoga in 2015. I was going through a breakup and um, didn't really know what my next steps were. Okay. Found yoga. I had always been interested. And then um, immediately, I, I don't know if it was my personality or the charisma that people liked or caught on to, but it was kind of like, okay, we're pushing you because we want you to take a teacher training. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Um, <laughs> I wasn't so interested, but yeah. it was handed to me. Wow. And that blew me away. And that was like, okay, there's something there. I don't know what this is. And I was very much a believer in, uh, okay, things, if they come to you, then see where they'll take you. Mm -hmm. And six months, and six days of my after my first yoga class that I ever took, I was teaching wow. my first class. Wow. Yeah. And I would say around that time is where I'm like, there's something here. I don't know what it is, but I know that I know I'm really good at it, but not in the way of like egotistically, I'm the best. It's just, this is what I'm here to do right now. There's, mm -hmm. I don't see anything else. I see that this is what it is. This is wow. what I'm good at. This is what yeah. I like. I enjoy it. I connect with mm -hmm. people. I help them. Done. Yeah. Wow. And then, how was it? Uh, how was it? How was yoga help? Because you wrote that you were kind of like diagnosed with ADHD in your early childhood or teenage years. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Why was it? Um, how was it actually to grow up with this like diagnosis? And then, like, how has yoga helped to kind of like? find the right frame or even like, how do you say, I wouldn't even say like cure it, just like sure. live with it. Yeah. Um, maybe a, like, I think I want to give actually a stronger opinion on ADHD and maybe a slightly yeah. controversial one because of my experience. And I think yep. I, I want to speak at least from my experience. I can't speak for everyone's, but I mean, I was the nineties kid that was put on medication from the age of seven, mm -hmm. right? Parents went through a divorce and my sister and I both had anxiety issues she had mm -hmm. another form of anxiety or ocd and such mm -hmm. and i had adhd anxiety ocd everything went through every type of psychotherapy test wow. trial drugs uh the teachers are like hey you're on your kid is wild let's give him medication and not wow. hey let's help him understand what's going on with the fact that he's stressed or anxious or his parents he's just lost both parents in this direction of okay now he goes to mom's house to dad's house like, no, no, no. Adderall, Concerta, Zoloft, Lexapro, wow. Clonopin, everything. And okay, let's do more. And then the more expensive the doctor, the more medicine you got. Crazy. And so what I, yeah, I, I think what I realized is I didn't know who I was. And at first I wanted to become a psychiatrist, like someone that okay. prescribed these things because I'm like, I'm going to help people. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Funny enough, uh, the best friend I had at the time was like, uh, one day he just said, Brad, you um, you don't seem like you necessarily have 
ADHD, I don't know what you have, but maybe you should just try going off of the medication. Wow. And funny enough, around that same time, um, my health insurance was canceled. My, I didn't have much contact with my dad. Okay. And so I told my mom, and I was like, mom, um, let, she's like, you need to get new health insurance. And yes, but most importantly, let's go off of medication. Wow. And then let's see. She freaked out. My twin mm -hmm. sister freaked out. My family was like, no, you have to be on medication. That's what you are. I mean, I, I, that was my identity. Seven years old wow. every day until 21. Oh, you said it's, it's seven years old. You started yeah. taking medication. Yeah. Wow. And I think that that's what's crazy. At seven years old, you don't, you don't know who the fuck you are. There's no chance. You're in a developmental stage. Mm -hmm. And your brain's in a developmental stage. Absolutely. And I, and I understand that you might be crazy or wild, but you need... Let's say good nutrition, good sport, good movement. You need a way to express this energy out. And American lifestyle is sit at a desk and pay attention for I don't know how many six hours a day at seven years mm -hmm. old to learn something. And then you go home and you have a chaotic house life. What do you think is going to happen? And Gabor Mate says ADHD is not an actual mental illness. It's a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that's and it's the coping mechanism of everything's stressful around you so you learn to disengage you learn to not think and not not listen to what's going on so it's to me that's not a drug that's it that's a here i need to learn how to meditate and pay attention to my feelings my thoughts and everything wow. in between and my emotions yeah. and then i can develop further with what i need I'm not saying it's perfect there are many times i forget to listen but people don't necessarily associate me with adhd um when they see me they don't say oh brad you have adhd and when i hear people always say I have ADHD, I have ADHD, I label myself as ADHD, now I can't pay attention. I see it as an excuse instead mm -hmm. of as a place for growth. And that's when I really like to challenge people because that's just their way of saying, I don't actually have to do the work. Do the work. You don't have to share with everyone what you have. Do the work and you'll mm -hmm. see how it changes. And so when I found, um, I mean, I, I would say for sure, I still experience anxiety in many areas. And, and these things come to light when you have deep conversations, challenging talks, and you can express yourself. But we all have this. Absolutely. If you can function, if you can find good moments to enjoy your life, I think that's the most important thing. And so yeah. what if you feel, excuse my language, but fucked up in the head? Like there are areas where you can express it or find help, but then enjoy the finer things in life because there are so many nice things in life to have. <laughs> and we often forget this because we think we're like, a broken shattered glass that we're not absolutely so uh, i think like uh, i think that's interesting but um to come back to it uh, yeah 21 i went off of medication for a year and a half i felt like i was in another world it's the best way i can describe it i really was it was like every day you wake up i, I wish i could wow. do, like give you a mental picture of what's in my brain but you wake up dull kind of like not mm -hmm. not excited at all when you when it takes the hit it's like coffee, but maybe times, I don't know, 50 in terms of your excitement. You're like, whoa, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm excited. I'm motivated. Boom. Isn't it actually also like methamphetamine almost? It is. Yeah, it yeah. is. It, it's a form of speed, more or less, but pharmaceutical <laughs> wow. grade. So wow. or I guess, right? It's called amphetamine, I believe. Or I forgot if the label is methamphetamine or amphetamine. It's one of those on there. Yeah. It's just amphetamine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, have you ever experienced, have you ever tried Adderall. Yeah, but not not Adderall, but like um, amphetamine. I've I've tried and so okay. yeah, yeah. I never actually never did anything to me. It was like I don't know. <laughs> I, if you take enough, I think it does. It yeah. um, it's funny because I went off of it, and then when I was finishing my um, bachelor's degree in yeah. college, um, in psychology actually, a friend of mine had Adderall. So mind you, uh, I I said something earlier, which is I had the most expensive doctor, and he gave me the most ex the most medication. He put me on 90 milligrams of Adderall in one day. 90. Okay, what, okay. what is this like in reference? In like... Whoa. I don't know how, <laughs> how to reference it, but like some people only take 10. In wow. A day. Wow. And wow. I took 10 from the, my friend to study for my history course, yeah. my history final the next day. I was up for, I don't know, 14 hours. I aced the test and I only needed one pill, 10 milligrams. So that was the kind of... Um, I don't know, adaptation that my body was used to at the age of seven. It was just like, 
boom, this many drugs. And then they wanted to give you um, Zoloft and Lexapro to sleep, by the way. Before you go to bed, please take this anti-anxiety pill. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, first day, first day. so you can imagine my experience. Yeah, it's like, really? Okay, cool. How much of a zombie can I be? I don't even know who I am. And um, yeah. So then, but to yeah, mm -hmm. fast forward it, let's say, I guess. Um, and it's really funny because I don't share this story much. I think it's on my website somewhere. Uh, but typically, I just like to share the, the, the beauty of movement and the beauty of breath work and Absolutely. the beauty of meditation. Because I feel like those are solutions to understanding you, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, there's a difference between muscle building, fitness training, uh, rock climbing, other types of sports, and then actual just body movement where you breathe and you explore what's going on mm -hmm. in your muscles. And there's not really much of a place for that, I, I would say. I don't like the spiritual aspect of yoga so much. I don't, I, I think because it's important for me to distill like in this Western world, more of a realistic um, societal approach to movement and not mm -hmm. this depth of yoginess, mm -hmm. because I think people need that. And if they want to go to this, like the very spiritual esoteric places, they can, this is their entry point. Yeah. But I'm happy to distill my information from a very spiritual aspect to a very realistic, hey, what's going on with your right leg right now? Close your eyes, breathe, and see what you feel. Mm -hmm. Oh, if I move my leg a little bit to the right, that actually went away. Yeah, yeah. wow, good job. Yeah. Hey, first time in 30 <laughs> years. Yes. <laughs> we're, I mean, but don't, yeah, don't forget, we're also always in a productive state here we always want mm -hmm. to push forward push forward push mm -hmm. forward and we don't have time to actually sit down stop and find the yang and that's that beauty you know the yin yang symbol is amazing because you have this space and i'm very yang by the way i'm always going as well um my body says no it says no and then i you know i stop and some, i mean i'm human sometimes i get injured i do it's mm -hmm. fine um it's part of what i can go through but yeah i, I feel like all of those movements, the stretching, the flexibility poses, the challenging movements, the physical, like playful, animalistic movements, mm -hmm. those are things our body is meant to do, I would say. And mm -hmm. it's so it's very interesting to see how when you do that, you feel better yeah, and you feel more focused. And obviously the biochemistry of your blood changes when you move. So, but people don't realize it and they just pump themselves full with like, here's bicep curl, bicep curl, bicep curl, bicep curl, so I can look better. Here's shoulder press, shoulder press, shoulder press, shoulder press, so I can look better. Here's stomach press, stomach press, stomach press. You're not moving everything in a system, mm -hmm. in a whole. And I think you need that from time to time. You mm -hmm. really need that. And so, I swear to God, I've seen the tightest bodies at a gym. And I just sit there and I go, you don't look okay. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, it's not in a negative way. You don't look okay. You look like you mm -hmm. need just a place to calm down. Yeah, and I think this, this reminds me, um, a friend of mine, he also practiced some, I forgot what movement, but he, he explained this concept it's actually that um, when the muscles, like it's, or like everything is too tight, there's actually, it's better if there's, it's more loose. It kind of like to feel also like there's more, how did, <laughs> now I'm really bad at explaining this concept, but it's he okay. said, you know, when, um, what you just uh, described, like when you just go to the gym and just pump yourself up, yeah. your body becomes also very tight. You know, it's like this very, like strong but all the time very tight and tense and actually what we should strive for is much more relaxed and 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 relaxed state of strength so to say i think we need the balance between both mm -hmm. and i think it also is so dependent on what you do in your life and this mm -hmm. is what i've started to notice because a lot of people i would say in the yoga world are very very special <laughs> very emotional <laughs> very like and whenever I talk with a, a new potential business partner and yeah. whether it's sports or whether it's, um, I don't know, something online, you hear how, how a lot of people talk differently to yogis because we need the emotional okay. side yeah. and not the just straightforward, hey, here. And that I actually find in like a yoga philosophy, you also have to learn how to adapt yourself to your current state and not always be so flowery butter butterfly unicorn mm -hmm. face mm -hmm. you know you can be spiritual you can find this but you can also stay here too in the present moment um now to to your point about fascia uh, like what i it sounds like is like the fascial connections within the muscles having tight tension mm -hmm. 
there are certain purposes for that, which are, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously emotionally and physically, your fascia react. So if you're mm-hmm. emotionally stressed all the time, you are going to have a tight body. Sorry, that's how it works. Look at yeah. the nervous system and look at every connection from brain to toe. You're going to see how affected that is. And on a literal physical level, the nerves from like your big toe go all the way to your brain. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're stressed in one position of your body, where do you think it's going to hit? Oh, no, it's just in my head. No, no, it's just in my head. I just need to clear my head. Let me go for a run. What does mm-hmm. a run do? A run is hyper, high stress. That's what CEOs love to do. Sprint, run, get more mm-hmm. high stress. Mm-hmm. And then you see why they get burned out faster. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to take the inside. Yes. But, zum Beispiel, okay, for example, <laughs> <laughs> just love the Danglish part. Um, for example, um, my work with professional athletes, yeah, they have to have tension in the body. Otherwise, yeah. they can't perform. Wow. If you do not have a tight body, you are not as fast. You cannot move as quick. You can't hold tension when someone pushes you. Mm. And you cannot kick a ball so well. If you look at the, the kick, like on a YouTube video, if you look at, type in something, I think like fascial integrity of a soccer kick or something around these lines, you're going to see a winding up of one arm. So weird. Mm. Like the left hand or something turns inwards and makes a fist. The right hand does it the same in a very weird way. And you see people with fingers like this half the time. And then they kick the ball with a rounded spine and a straight leg. And that ball moves in the craziest way. There's no chance yeah. in, in hell that I can ever do that without years of skill and practice. Because that is, a, that is a fascial tension and muscular integration. Mm-hmm. That is, and that is from the ability to create that tension and go fast. Mm-hmm. Now, I have, I have good racket speed and good tennis speed, so if I play tennis against these people, I'll mostly destroy them because I, I understand the tensioning between my shoulders and mm-hmm. these movements, but not in, not in soccer. And I think football or whatever I'm calling it, I'm probably mixing up the words. But yeah, this is, this is where then it's more about um, creating the balance to help them mm-hmm. recover and give them the space to where they can maintain that tension but at the same time release it in a way that gives them the best rest and recovery so they can do it as long as they want. And then maybe when they're done with their football careers, they can actually really go deeper into it and then allow their body to relax more, which is important. And I think people have a hard time doing that because the love for the game, the love for playing games for the brain, how good that is for the brain. It's like, I got to keep going. I got to keep playing. I'm, I'm 55 years old. I've had four knee replacements or whatever, and I'm still playing weekly soccer. I don't do any yeah. physical sport i don't do any yoga i just play soccer and i think then then actually this kind of comes handy in place a bit a bit of like the spirit, spiritual path like i like to understand that we are always changing there's always kind of like a death process going on so that we you know like if we actually hold on to this personality we we once were as a professional football player and then we're like yeah. 55 and we kind of stick to this personality instead of kind of like letting go and letting this part go yeah, I think this can cause in some form suffering because you can like stick to this identity, who you were, and yeah. you can like, yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot of paths for that. You do see some mm-hmm. people when I, I see do I do see some athletes that that's the only thing they know. They don't yeah. really have another identity besides this, and you it looks like from the outside appearance that they're already suffering because they mm-hmm. don't know what's going on next if they're not playing, which is their own the only goal that they have not just the, the the money but it's the the goal is for them to play you know um and then i i really see in that position of going okay what is your who are you as a person mm-hmm. i think that's why it's so helpful to have sports psychologists in these yeah. um, places as well because i mean i can pretend to play sports psychologist but it's helpful if i work with your body first and then and I do have a degree in psychology, but it's helpful if I work in a different way, I would say, than, than this. And I, I think that is very fascinating to see. And you do see some soccer players, I find them very, very smart with the way that they handle who they think they are as a person. Some mm-hmm. of them, I know one or two are still studying. One finished their master's degree and oh, wow. still plays professional mm-hmm. sports. Amazing. You know, others invest. Um, have proper investments so they they have a way to have financial security afterwards some have other interests like environmental um, interests mm-hmm. and taking care of actually this world and don't drive the car to the stadium like to wherever as much as possible so i think that's 
um, to me, this spirituality part you just mentioned seems more like who, what is your identity as you exactly. and not of your actions as you get older. Mm -hmm. And that I think you're right. You do change, you do grow, you do develop. A goal is just a goal. And then once you get the goal, there's always going to be another goal and then another goal and then another mm -hmm. goal. It doesn't matter. Okay, so you got the house, now what? Absolutely. You got the <laughs> wife, now what? <laughs> oh, now I'm not happy with my wife. Yeah, why? Because well, I got her. Great. Have you done anything for her? No. <laughs> but she's really hot. Great. Great. <laughs> like, like, okay, cool. Yeah, but I think this is for many... Very interesting. I uh, just read about. Have you ever, in your psychology studies, um, stumbled upon the work by Alfred Adler? Does this ring a bell? He was one. He was also an Austrian psychiatrist. Um, he was part of kind of like the Freud, Carl Jung yes, and Jung, trio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Alfred Adler, amazing work. Um, he's, I'm just re read second book about his work, and he talked to us about love. And he said, like you know, falling in love is the easy part. Anyone can do it. But actually, love itself is understanding there's not you and me there's just us and we actually work together it's actually really like a very um conscious way of doing things very like it's actually you have to do things it's not just it just doesn't happen yeah it just reminded me of this story it, i it is i think love is also your daily actions right it's yeah, your exactly. daily commitment to to the person or the people mm -hmm. around you and i feel like i'm learning this i feel like i was very selfish the last years and also giving but in different ways and now i start mm -hmm. to realize like when you want to very much deepen friendships or deepen time with people it's not about your fact that you express love and like, hey you're amazing mm -hmm. it's actually what are you doing for them and taking it's time yeah i mean time is your greatest resource anyways Absolutely. so it is it's this like i couldn't agree more it's um okay this person's stressed do you have the time and capacity to help them with their stress sure is that their job or is that your job to help them, right? Are, are they relying on you or are you more supporting them? That's another mm -hmm. whole depth of the topic. But um, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's very easy to love anyone. There, there are two things that come to mind. <laughs> one, well, one person in, a, in our yoga teacher training in 2015, oh my God. Um, <laughs> he had just come back from a 10-day silent meditation retreat, which actually inspired okay. me to go on my own as well. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, and what did he say? He's like, you can love someone the same as you love a butterfly. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. That's cool. super weird, but it kind of makes sense in some weird, like, I mean, you can you can love anything. Mm -hmm. Try to find a way to, whatever that quality of love is for you, you can try to transmit it to anything, I would say. Um, and then, what was it? Jay Shetty's one that's gone very viral on Instagram. Okay. Have you seen this? Mm -mm. what's that so he was saying what's the difference between like and love if you like a flower you mm -hmm. pick it if you love a flower you water it daily yes and i was like That's okay so true. it is it, it's it's rooted in in action and commitment that's what mm -hmm. love is mm -hmm. wow yeah and as a actually this brings me to an interesting question because like for me so what i hear i was like your teaching philosophy is kind of like your philosophy emphasizes on personal responsibility and kind of like also walking one's own path and actually has much to do with difference between liking and loving because um how do you actually keep the balance in guiding your students or people you work with to encourage them to make their own discoveries and decisions great question i don't know what's going on in that brain of yours but great question <laughs> wow um for me, it's, I feel like um, I love to adjust and I love to assist, but I don't do it very often anymore mm -hmm. because I find I do very small assists. People tell, people have explained to me how much they love assists and adjustments, um, which I would say I do it in the, pro in the professional sports world a bit more often because these guys are so tight and so tired. And so I do a lot more of these manipulations and manual therapy, mm -hmm. which I think is important. In a yoga class, I don't do it as much. I keep more of my energy. Um, but I feel like I give small micro movements. Like I'll touch someone's, the inside of someone's left knee, just like that. Yeah. Not even, not, I mean, lovingly, but not like, you know, <laughs> caressing and all yeah, this. Yeah. Like, oh, this feels so good. I'll go like, no, no, a little bit that way. And then you see the, 
the little slight stressor or the little stripe it's like oh, okay now i understand for their own responsibility mm -hmm. and i also do a lot of repetitions in my class so my classes more feel like a mobility and breath and flexibility course and not so much a yoga class because i want people to get a feeling for understanding and mastering their own skill of movement mm -hmm. and that's so important it's not just sit and hold sit and hold is one thing that's great for the mental strength but people are already mentally exhausted sometimes they just need to get lost in a movement Mm -hmm. And then you can guide them with small cues from time to time to go, okay, try this. I can't do everything in one hour. I cannot prioritize, okay, here's just an adjustment course. I'm going to massage you for an hour while you move and make you feel incredibly relaxed. But then I, you have no responsibility to create your own relaxation. You mm -hmm. only have to come to my course for this relaxation. And to me, that doesn't make sense. I want you to have the power. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can't just sit and hold them all the time if they're in a space where they're already breaking down. I, there's, mm -hmm. There are courses for that. Um, it's really my style, I would say. Maybe <laughs> once a year I'll do that. Yeah. But I think when I'm teaching, I want you to... You took one of my classes, actually. Yeah. I'm, so yeah. I'm curious what your opinion is. But for me, it's about get yourself lost in the movement. Try... It's so easy to get in the, be in your head, and I feel like I know this quite well from my past. Uh, it's quite easy to be in your head, and that's the point. All you need is a big inhale, a big exhale, and a move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you can start to make softer inhales and exhales the more experienced you are, because then you can train yourself to actually be more relaxed and focus in a class and get into that state of calm. But a lot of people come into those classes completely stressed. Mm -hmm. They're looking to you to be their king guider of whatever and then i like to maybe without them knowing maybe with them knowing after this podcast for sure them knowing they're their own it's their responsibility Absolutely. they're the ones that are going to bring that self to them i'm here to create the space and to give you the space right i am not your um like what tony robbins says and some people what i this is also what i find funny a lot of students say this is my guru i'm definitely not your fucking guru no fucking way <laughs> you are you are here's some information for you and you are and if you have questions i will help you with all that i know i will give you everything i've got but you are the guru i'm not your guru and uh i mean i'm happy to be your teacher for 20 plus years sure but i'm not your guru wow that's powerful uh, yeah and i think it's so again uh this remind uh, you read i'm going to recommend you two books as a, uh, by Alfred yes, Adler. it's amazing okay. because he talks about exactly this is like you know to first understand it all starts with, um, yeah, self-love and self-reliance. And also like the courage, the courage to be happy also means taking responsibility to take these actions and understanding you are in charge of your creating your own reality. And like, there's no one else who gives you kind of like the silver spoon. Yes, you get guidance and support, but it's you. There's, don't rely on gurus or gods. It's all you. And, but maybe people don't want to take this responsibility. No, and that's why that's why businesses work in many ways <laughs> because they sell this as, "Hey, I'm I've got you. I'm going to take mm -hmm. responsibility for you, and here you go." Um, but yeah, it's a good point. You know, um, for me, like I have a new project at um, at a like a video content studio space where I'm wow. finally doing my own classes after a certain amount of years and I want to build online content as well. And yeah. I've always gone back and forth with building content, but I feel like for me, what's been important, my wish is to have a team, mm -hmm. to work with a team, to develop a team, because the only way you also can grow as a person is when you learn how to work with others. And a yeah. lot of yoga teachers work by themselves. Why? Why do you think that? Where I, w I would say we're not, I would say many of us are not good at working in teams. We don't know how to manage emotions or communicate effectively, I would say, because this mm -hmm. whole yoga world is very spiritual, emotional, esoteric, philosophical, and, and your ability to work in a team is very helpful. And what I notice, this is just my opinion, and I can be wrong, but what I've seen a lot is oftentimes yoga studio owners are very different from the yoga teachers. They have a very different personality. Oh. You can't be as close to them because they've had to learn to develop those characteristics of, mm -hmm. hey, I'm managing the response. I'm creating a space 
responsible for helping others on their own life path, whatever it is. And I'm creating space where yoga teachers can actually survive to some extent. Yeah. That's super important to learn that skill, in my opinion. That's one of the mm -hmm. greatest gifts you can give is to open, I don't know, a studio or to have a space Absolutely. where you can work with others and give them the ability to live and to do their craft. So I think at some point that is my next step and that's been my wish. And what I also realized is once you take the step on the path, a lot of a million other things come your way. So there's always ADHD present, in my opinion. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh, I can go that way or that way or that way or that way or that way. And when you're a freelance, yeah, when you're a freelancer and you're good at what you do, there's always an opportunity. But people just want you as their brand. They don't right. know where they're taking you or what they're building with you. They just want you to do whatever they want. And you have to then, I think, start to, so I would love to read this book because that's, I think, where my step is coming on my 35th birthday. It's going, hey, okay, now it's time to actually know what I want and go for what I want. And then I want people, I want to bring people in instead of people yep. coming to me. And I know exactly what I want to do with them and how I want to support them because that would have been my greatest wish is that someone says, hey, I'm bringing you in. I want to support you and bring you here. And mm -hmm. actually, that's how we met. I got lucky because I got brought into Vienna to teach workshops at, <laughs> at Tribe Yoga with this amazing yoga teacher, Christina. And then we met rock climbing. Yeah, we're rock climbing. It was, uh, it was, I see, actually, it was yesterday. No, on Monday, I was at the same yoga studio where you held a class. Really? You had Tribe? Yes. yes, I went to Tribe. Which class did you take? Um, Visiana, Vis, was called, was, uh, no, I forgot the name. Something with V. <laughs> Valentina? No, the, the class, it's a yoga, I think. Oh, Vinyasa. Uh, vinyasa. Vinyasa one and two. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you don't know the, who the teacher was. I all figured out. But I mentioned your name, so she knew you, so. Really? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> and how was the class? I really enjoyed it. So for me, I was now after I was now in Peru and as I came back, I was like, there was like this shift, like, oh, wow, I want to really try something completely different. I was like, this very like urge to go back. I'm going to try yoga now. And I really enjoyed it. It was like this, it was very intense, but beautiful because like you had this, you move your body in all kinds of directions and it was intense and you're like, wow. It's like, I felt, I mean, very challenging for me, but I loved yeah. it. It was like, I it was very good. Loved it. And that's actually it reminded me of your yoga class because it was like there's not much thinking, you just go and there's a movement, you just like yeah. Another way of mindfulness, very much. Yeah, yeah. You you have to pay attention, you have to move, you don't have time to think, and then at exactly. the end you can do what you need. You can it's a very intense practice of being in a presence because you have to first listening to what the guide says, and secondly, listen to your body and like combine both. It's a beautiful practice. Yeah. I think so too. Uh, the thing I love to bring people in that don't have either don't have a good opinion of yoga, are scared to join yoga, or aren't so open to it, mm -hmm. because um, the way that I teach is so vastly different from others. Mm -hmm. I would say that it it brings you this space of oh okay I can do that. Oh that was way better than I thought. You know and. Um, and then it's like, oh my God, my body actually feels better. I, my hips feel open. I feel free. Like one of my memories is obviously in the football or the, with the with the soccer club here in Cologne. <laughs> the boys are so funny. Oh my God. But like, you know, some of them are like, all right, ready for yoga. Let's go. And then we do, you know, the shortest 10 minute session you can imagine. And it's just wow. move, 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 yeah, move, yeah, yeah. move, 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 move. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see sometimes on their face, they're like, oh, that was, that's intense. And then directly after, they jump up because there's no shavasana, no mm -hmm. chance. And they have to go sprint and train afterwards. They jump Amazing. up, they move their hips and they move their shoulders. And they're like, whoa, I feel free. I feel so free. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so free. <laughs> yeah, good. Come tomorrow? No, I'm good for two weeks. <laughs> I'll see you in two weeks. It's like, <laughs> bad idea. Right, okay. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> By the way, how did you did you continue? Uh, do you still climb to do bouldering? Unfortunately, I injured my knee. Oh. Um, yeah, and I think that's also part of being hyper flexible. I mean, I I do a lot of strength training too. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm taking more of a back seat to practicing yoga in my own respect because I'm so flexible. There are mm -hmm. many movements that I do anyways in general, like spine work, breath work, 
always. Mm -hmm. um, but my hips are really open. My knee flexion and extension is ridiculous. And so I was bouldering. And um, yeah, and it was like uh, seven weeks ago tomorrow now. It's almost, it's almost healed. It, but mm -hmm. uh, I have, I think, a small tear in my MCL. It's the inside of my left knee. Oh, okay. And, but yeah, I mean, it happens. It you know? happens. You work hard. But, but that's the thing. It's like you're hyper flexible and then you mm -hmm. don't know how to engage your muscles properly mm -hmm. or you do engage, but then you have a relaxed moment. And in that relaxed moment, you still create tension in another part of your body, mm -hmm. which is, I would say, quite advanced, but also not advanced when you're not sure what's going on. So I had a very deep twist with my spine to the left. I moved my knees to the right or my left knee to the right, which like a, I think it's called a valgus or vagus, no, valgus mm -hmm. movement. And that's when you put too much pressure on the MCL. And I heard this slight, very, very light. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, okay. I'm, good. I'm done climbing for today. <laughs> yeah. But, but, um, yeah, yeah, but I think um, also what you mentioned before, just pedaling back a bit, it was very interesting, the part you mentioned, but like now you want to work with a team as well. And again, I'm going to, it's the third time I'm going to mention Alpha Dadler, so you have to read it. What are the books? Can you at least so recommend them for all books. of us the to hear? The first book I would okay. recommend reading The Courage to be Disliked. It's, oh, yeah. I'm yeah. working on this in my life. That's hard. That, whoa. It's a great <laughs> book. So it's, it's, it's written by actually a Japanese author. And the book is beautiful, beautiful because it's kind of like written in a Socrates style where it's dialogue between a philosopher and a youth. And he kind of okay. like walks him through the, like the, the, the foundation of Ar Alfred Adlers. And Alfred Adler said, like, it's, it's, it's remarkable. He was so far ahead of his time that all, like, a lot of suffering or problems comes from interpersonal, interpersonal relationship. They're all interpersonal relationship problems. Because, you know, as a, think about it, as a child, actually, we are probably, <clears throat> our mind develops way faster than our body. So you always kind of, like, uh, compare ourselves with what other people can do and you cannot do. And like, there's like, it starts there. But also he said the flip side is happiness and joy comes also from interpersonal relationships and understanding that actually we're here to work together. And this we can only do by, in, by realizing what is our, what makes us unique. Because then we understand we all contribute equally and we're moving in one direction. Thank you.